Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Liz Cohen. I'm Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and I am delighted to welcome you to today's lecture by Nora Volkoff entitled The Sleep-Deprived Human Brain. And hopefully we don't have too many of those in the audience today. Here at Radcliffe, we are dedicated to fostering and to sharing path-breaking work across disciplines. And we do this by convening leading scholars, scientists, and artists and by organizing a full calendar of public programming, including conferences, lectures like the one you're at today, and exhibitions. Our program today is part of the Davis Lecture Series, established by Kim and Judy Davis to bring leading thinkers in all fields to the Radcliffe Institute to give public talks. I'm very glad to see Kim in the audience here today, and I am thrilled to have Nora Volkoff as our Davis Lecturer this afternoon. Now, it's very rare to find Nora's formidable combination of talents in a single individual. Nora is an intrepid and prolific scientist, having published over 600 journal articles, but she is also a tireless and compelling advocate. Nora shares her research with the public and with policymakers, helping to shape our national debate on crucial health issues in critical ways. And as if that weren't enough, Nora is also a committed and distinguished administrator, having served since 2003 as director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and before that, in senior roles at the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Nora is renowned for her pioneering use of brain imaging to study the toxic effects and addictive properties of drugs of abuse. Nora's research was instrumental in showing that addiction is a chronic disease of the brain, an insight with major implications both for psychiatry and for policy. This body of work has been critical to identifying the neurochemical mechanisms of the brain that play a role in individual vulnerability to substance use disorders. It would be hard to overstate the importance of this research. The brain disease model of addiction uh, represented a fundamental change from the previously widespread view that substance abuse disorders reflect weak willpower or moral failing. Among the outcomes of this paradigm shift was the passage of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Act of 2008, which required health insurance providers to offer the same types of coverage for mental health, including addiction, that they provide for other diseases. Nora's work has also been central to our understanding of the neurobiology of obesity, of ADHD, and of aging. In her lecture today, Nora will discuss brain imaging studies in investigating the effects of sleep deprivation, highlighting important links between sleep and addiction and other diseases. Now, the story of how Nora came to do this kind of research is unusual. Nora grew up in Mexico City in the house where her great-grandfather, Leon Trotsky, lived in exile until his assassination in 1940. After graduating at the top of her class in medicine at the National University of Mexico, Nora became fascinated by a brain imaging technology called positron emission tomography, or PET for short. So Nora traveled to New York University School of Medicine, where researchers were doing PET imaging in collaboration with the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Nora was already impressive by her mid-20s, and these scientists seized the opportunity to hire her. Nora then enrolled in NYU's residency program in psychiatry and used PET imaging to study brain tumors and schizophrenia. She soon earned the Laughlin Fellowship Award from the American College of Psychiatrists, which is given annually to outstanding psychiatric residents deemed likely to make a significant contribution into the field. Nora next joined the faculty of the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, intending to continue her research into schizophrenia. When she discovered a shortage of appropriate patients at the university hospital, she had a novel idea to use the same imaging technique to study patients admitted for psychosis from having taken cocaine. 
This investigation led to the breakthrough discovery that cocaine, which was generally considered safe at the time, is in fact toxic and damages the brain by decreasing blood flow. Her findings went so against the grain that no science journal would publish them for three years. Nora's commitment to gather data and follow them wherever they lead, even when her results challenge the public and scientific consensus, has remained the keystone to what makes her work so compelling. After moving on to Brookhaven National Laboratory and the State University of New York at Stony Brook, Nora served in a number of leadership roles while continuing her ambitious research program on addiction. In her current position as director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, Nora's advocacy for new policies and treatments based on sound science has been vital. But she is also an inspiring model of someone who effectively combines scientific research, institutional leadership, and policy advocacy. So now, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Nora Volkoff. Well, thanks very much. That was very kind. Good afternoon, everybody. It's actually a pleasure to be here. And since, uh, uh, um, and I, I'm just sort of humbled by the very nice introduction and the point that says, well, I hope that there are not many people who are sleep deprived here. I sort of says, I am one of them. <laughs> <laughs> My life is very, very crazy. So, and um, it's very unusual for me to come into a, a, a forum right now that we're amidst the opioid crisis and speak of something that's not specifically directly related to drugs. And, 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 and this uh, is related to drugs because as uh, I, I basically was being told, I mean, everything, almost everything that we know about how the brain works is negatively influenced by drugs. But, but this will dwell much more into the process of sleep. And, and it reflects uh, studies that we have been doing in uh, my laboratory to try to address the important question about why is it that we sleep? As sleep is, uh, we spend at least uh, 30 to 40% of our time uh, sleeping and that during sleep we are extraordinarily vulnerable and yet despite this vulnerability, uh, biologically we cannot forego sleep, which clearly highlights that it is a it must play a, an extraordinary fundamental role. Why did I start to get engaged on sleep? And I, I started to get involved with sleep, interested on the concept of sleep in my brain from two perspectives. One of them, the recognition that patients that were basically addicted to drugs have very severe disruption of the sleep patterns. And, and there was something that was very salient, and, and at that time I was very much engaged on studying cocaine. And uh, cocaine in animal models produced something that actually no other drug can produce, and very few drugs can produce. And it's if you give an animal free availability of the drug, um, ultimately the only drug where animals will forego sleep is cocaine. And as a result of foregoing this sleep, these animals will be dead within three weeks of actually free availability to drugs. And it is recognized also in animal experiments that if you, animals do not survive sleep deprivation. But to me, it was so very telling in terms of how profoundly drug can remove the basic instincts for survival that it could lead an animal to stop sleeping in order to get the drug. And that was one of the first things that said, uh, well, there is something in there. The other aspect that I was very intrigued about sleep, and that will lead me to the first uh, part of my, my talk, which has two components. One of them, studies of sleep that very, very specifically address the question, does sleep influence the brain dopamine system? And the brain dopamine system is the main mechanism by which drugs are rewarding. All of the drugs that produce addiction activate the dopamine system. And, if, uh, and, and, so it is, and, and this activation ultimately results in those people that take it regularly and that have vulnerability in changes that produce addiction. But it is that dopamine that gives us there, that leads us there. The dopamine system is what assigns saliency to values, so to, to reinforcers. It's what motivates our action. And I've always been very curious and intrigued about why is it that in general, drug taking behavior tends to occur much more towards the end of the day. Why is it that most people tend to actually binge at that period of time? 
And you could put up to questions, to answers to that, and says, well, it's social systems, right, that lead to uh, in the morning we, we work, and in the evening we then play and party. But then if you are more critical and say, is this just an aleatory phenomena? I would say it's very unlikely to be an aleatory phenomena. It's likely to reflect the biology of all of our circadian rhythms. So I became very intrigued about the concept, what happens to the circadian variability, to the differences in function of our dopamine system in the morning versus the evening that could make drugs more rewarding towards the end of the day than in the morning. So that's what led me to think very much on the first part of the talk, which is the one related to the dopamine system. The second one is a new space that we've gone on to, but it's also extraordinarily important, that relates to the role of sleep in, uh, in basically uh, being able to detoxify our brain from um, proteins and molecules such as beta amyloid that are, of course, implicated in Alzheimer's disease. So, and I, the first part of the talk is uh, so our studies that we have been doing for many years now. The last part of the talk is new studies that have not yet been published. They are in press. So we know that sleep is fundamental, and we recognize it from the perspective of all of us that have been sleep deprived, that when we are badly sleep deprived, our cognitive performance goes down. And one of the processes that's most disrupted, certainly in my brain, is that of memory. So when I have to fly abroad and I have to give a talk in a different language, it becomes very awkward because I, don't, I, I am afraid that I will forget the words when I'm speaking. So uh, it does interfere with cognitive performance sleep. But we also know that that interferes with alertness. And part of our impairments in cognitive performance may be that our alertness and arousal goes down. So we cannot sustain effort. We cannot sustain attention. And that is one of the main mechanisms that results in accidents. And if you look at it in terms of the statistics of accidents in the United States, as it is the case in, in other areas of the world too, there are more people and more fatalities associated with uh, uh, car accidents linked with sleep impairments and improper sleep behavior that they are with alcohol. So it's as important as that. We don't explain, express it like that, but it does play a very significant toll in public health. And the third element, more and more, we're recognizing that impaired sleep behaviors is associated with a variety of diseases, including a much higher risk of obesity. And this is, this is very elegantly studied and investigated with respect to what are the endocrine signals that are changed by sleep deprivation, as well as studies that now are starting to emerge to show that impaired sleep is also associated with higher risk for dementia. And the end of my talk, we present data to show you uh, our newest findings uh, with imaging in this respect. So let's start with the brain and the dopamine system. What is the role of dopamine? Is it recognized as important to the sleep-wake cycle? And there had been a lot of, uh, of, of controversy in this space, with some saying, no, dopamine is not important to actually sleep-wake cycle. And that was tended to be older literature. As more sophisticated technologies are emerging, it has become clear that the dopamine system is fundamental for arousal. Fundamental for arousal. And in fact, when you have anesthesia and you want to actually bring someone out of the anesthesia, one of the classical drugs that you give is a stimulant drug that increases dopamine. And if you want to awake an animal that is anesthetized, you can specifically stimulate the dopamine cells and they arouse. So it is recognized that the dopamine cells that are located in the midbrain, ventral tegmental area, and to a less extent, the substantia nigra, are very important in the arousal. In the middle, you see uh, that also data that has been shown uh, and replicated independently by various laboratories, that when you measure dopamine in the brain, and actually also when you measure it in reward regions of the brain that receive these very, very strong strong projections, terminals of dopamine, you see a circadian variability where the levels of dopamine vary as a function of time. Now, for those of you that are not very familiar with, with rats, 
uh, in the laboratory, rats, when it's dark, are very active, and that's when their dopamine system is more activated. And as they become quiescent and sleep, that's where the dopamine system goes down. So there's clear-cut evidence of this circadian variability. And it's gone to the point that researchers now have identified the protein in the brain that is responsible for this circadian variability of dopamine. And that is a molecule that we call dopamine transporter, whose function is to recycle. It brings dopamine back into the cell, removing it. And so when you don't have that protein, which is a very elegant way of regulating how much dopamine is outside, these animals lose their circadian variability. And then what, what, if you wanted and you needed more evidence of how important the dopamine system is, is to recognize that the most potent medications that we have to actually promote arousal, to keep people awake when they are on conditions of sleep deprivation, such as, for example, pilots or soldiers that have to perform under tremendous amount of stress over 24 or 48 hours, those are the stimulant drugs or drugs like modafinil. All of them increase dopamine and their uh, rousing effect are basically mediated by their dopaminergic actions predominantly. And it's also, we all recognize that in diseases that in affect the dopamine system, most notable recognized is Parkinson's disease because your dopamine cells get damaged. You lose 90% of the dopamine cells. They are profound disruption of the sleep well, it was sleep-wake cycle. So in line of that, we said, okay, all of these are animal studies. Let's then study the very specific question if indeed we're saying that there is, uh, there may be, and certainly in terms of patterns of social behavior, that overall the possibility that people may be more sensitive to reinforcers like drugs or like excessive food consumption towards the end of the day. Also, when people are sleep deprived, they are much less likely to regulate their own desires and much more likely to engage in impulsive behaviors. So, so we wanted to know, well, how does that translate from the perspective of the signaling mechanism in the human brain? And we use positron emission tomography, which is an imaging technology that allows us specifically to look at targets that are involved in signaling between neurons. And in this case, our targets was dopamine cells. And the way that we actually can look at them is by measuring the concentration of different proteins. So one of them is the dopamine transporters. And, I, and this is the protein that if you uh, remove it in animals, you remove the circadian variability. So we know from animal experiments, this is a, a key protein in regulating levels of dopamine. But we've also focused on the dopamine D2 receptor because the D2 receptor system is one of the main mechanisms that signals activation that ultimately may be responsible for motivation, for a reinforcement, for uh, arousal. And we do know that when you give drugs that block the dopamine D2 receptors, uh, you actually um, interfere with arousal. So this, this, uh, this produces sedation. So we decided to do a study to ask if we sleep deprived normal healthy people over one night of sleep depredation, uh, how much are there changes in these molecules that are the ones, very important ones, in, uh, in basically modulating dopamine signaling? So we studied subjects in which we measured dopamine transporters and we measured dopamine D2 receptors under two very different conditions. After they have slept all night and we monitor their sleep to secure that they were sleeping properly, that was one condition. And the other condition is, uh, we basically had someone with them all night long to ensure that they were awake. And we, of course, regulated so that they were not taking any substances that could directly impact uh, dopaminergic signaling, such as is the case of caffeine. And then what did we observe? So this is the design. We did a positron emission study, and at the end, uh, they were studied on two different days, one after rested sleep, the, the one after sleep deprivation, that's why we call it SD, and the other is that the rested wakefulness after a, a good night's sleep. We do the PET scans and then we do an MRI. And an MRI is another imaging technique that different from PET, which looks at biochemistry, allows, allows us to see how the brain is activated, the reactivity of the neuronal systems in the brain. So combining both of them gives us a, a biochemical perspective and a functional neuronal one. 
So what did we observe in terms of dopamine transporters? So these are the average images of all of the subjects to measure that actually uh, to depict the concentration of dopamine transporters after rested wakefulness. And you see the, the transporters are predominantly located into the striatum. And this is the same subjects, the average image for all of them after sleep deprivation. And you can just actually visually, uh, basically there's no difference. And when you quantify, and this was very surprising, I was expecting that with sleep deprivation, you would actually observe a decrease in the dopamine transporters. That's what, what I had predicted, because if you decrease dopamine transporters, that would amplify the dopaminergic signaling, and that would help sustain arousal since these subjects actually were not allowed to fall asleep. But we didn't observe that. Now, what about dopamine D2 receptors? And there what we observed was actually a significant difference. And this is, and I'll, I'll go into it, what it basically may mean with this technology. So what you are observing is that these are the levels of dopamine D2 receptors, again, in the same areas, because they are basically contiguous, contiguous cells where we measure transporters and receptors. In the, and bo all, both of them, of course, are located in the striatum. And this uh, actually is the average image for sleep deprivation. When you quantify it, whether it is in the caudate area or the putamen, which are parts of the, the dorsal striatum, you see a significant reduction in the binding of, of the ligand of this compound that binds to dopamine D2 receptors, which actually uh, was uh, very interesting. And at that time, and I'll, I hope I have a slide to, to basically explain to you uh, more specifically uh, how, why we interpret it that way. But at that time, the way that we interpret it is that this ligand binds to the receptors, um, but it can only bind to those receptors that are empty. It's like when you go to an auditorium and you can only sit on the chairs when there are no one is sitting there. This ligand all behaves exactly like that. So if there's a lot of dopamine, and those receptors are going to be occupied by dopamine, and then you will see a decrease in the binding of the ligand. And so this is a strategy that a lot of researchers are using to directly measure different stimuli, different drug effects on whether it changes dopamine concentration in brain. And we have been one of, uh, of, of the first laboratory to use it that way. In fact, we were the first laboratory. And so we interpret this to indicate this decrease in the dopamine D2 receptors that we observe here. We interpret it to, in, to, deter, to state when people are sleep deprived and they have to stay awake the next day, there is a compensation in order to maintain our, uh, alertness that leads to the increases on dopamine. That's the way that we actually reported on that journal neuroscience paper in 2008. It, I, I mean, and, and it was not completely in, in my brain, it was hurting. I mean, my brain hurts me. I have to confess to you all of these things. It was hurting me because we had consistently been studying effects of these stimulant drugs on our alertness and arousal, and we had consistently shown that the more you increase dopamine, the greater the arousal. So here, I'm going to show you what we observed when dopamine supposedly was increased by sleep deprivation and its relation to arousal. We're observing exactly the opposite. So we had in the past said, the more you change dopamine, uh, the less tired you are. And here, what we are observing, and this is the measure of changes in dopamine, so our interpretation is a decrease in the binding of our ligand. Uh, that basically, the more you change, the more the tired it was. So it was completely antithetical to everything that we had ever reported. And of course, my brain was hurting me. I mean, you cannot have two things in the same place. It was just, there was no space. And then what about cognition? And this was very important because when we've done these studies on stimulant medications that increase arousal, we also have observed that the extent to which they increase dopamine, if you are sleep deprived, they improve your arousal and your cognitive performance. And one of the tests that we have been using for many, many years, and so many laboratories is very standardized, it's a visual attention task. It's basically what you are asked to do is to pay attention uh, initially, and it goes increasingly more complicated, but you start with a simple one, and I said, okay, pay attention to this blue line, this blue dot here, and this blue dot that. 
And then the blue dots start to move, and I ask you, where are they? So you have to focus attention into basically under, remember where they were located at the end. Then you go into three of them and four to them, and then you can actually monitor accuracy. And we were doing these studies in these uh, rested or sleep deprived people um, in, while they were in the magnet. As you may imagine, these are the results that correspond to the rested versus the sleep deprivation, and as you may very, very much predict, performance went down where you're sleep deprived because you cannot sustain attention. And the, the harder it is the task, the worse the performance it got. So then we ask the question, I mean, is this in any way related to the changes in dopamine that we observe? And again, in, we had been consistently observed that the greater the increases in dopamine, uh, the greater the improvement on, on performance when you did it um, as a stimulant medication. And here, we actually observe exactly the opposite too. The greater the changes in the binding, the greater the decreases in the binding of the ligand, which we interpreted to actually mean that there was increases in dopamine, the worse the performance in those two areas. So this, first of all, did document that these changes in the binding of the ligand were important, both for behavior as it relates to the perception of arousal and tiredness, but they were also important for cognitive performance. And when we go on and look at the imaging studies themselves with, with fMRI, we also observe that indeed they're very much actually the D2 receptor changes were modulating the responses on activation. But I don't want to go into that because I'd rather dwell, in, I don't want to not be able to get into the last part of my talk. So what we had uh, reported was, uh, there you have, this is the, the technique that I was explaining. So this is the raclopride when the receptors are empty, it binds, and you see an image like this. When dopamine is occupied, basically, raclopride cannot bind and it goes down. And so that's when you interpret it to suggest there's a lot of dopamine and it occupies the receptor. And that had been the main, main, main hypothesis interpretation. What we did put, however, we cannot actually rule out the possibility that in sleep deprivation, the decreases were due to the fact that we have a decrease, a down regulation, what we call a down regulation of the levels of dopamine D2 receptors. Now, why we did not postulate this as the main interpretation? Which of course, when you look at things retrospectively, you say, of course. It's of course because it's actually everything. It was the, the relationship with behavior and cognition was opposite to everything else that we've seen. But the reason why I say it was not evident is that as we look and we continue to look at the modifications of the signaling system throughout the day or by drugs, we tend to focus very much on the effects of these stimuli on the content of the neurotransmitter. And we don't dwell very much on the fact that the expression patterns of these receptors in the membrane are very dynamic. And in fact, much more that we tend to actually identify as relevant. And that is exactly why we miss what I think is the main reason why we observe those, those particular, uh, the, the particular decrease in sleep deprivation of the binding of the ligand. So I could not, my brain is very obsessive. So I, and it was hurting me, so I said, okay, let me try to, to disentangle it. Because I couldn't, I, couldn't, I mean, I, this was an, something I could not rule out. So we designed a second study in which we said, let's try to differentiate that. If sleep deprivation is either increasing dopamine or down-regulating dopamine D2 receptors. But how do you disentangle that? Because with these ligands, you really cannot... Uh, the binding cannot differentiate whether it is just that the receptors are occupied or whether you have less receptors. So we basically took advantage also of methodologies that we have developed for other purposes. In our laboratory, we have been extensively studying methylphenidate. And actually, uh, some of this work was very much inspired by work that uh, Berta Madras and her team had done uh, here in Boston, uh, 
working with another dopamine transporter blocker, which is cocaine. And what is interesting about both cocaine and methylphenidate is that they block the dopamine transporter. And since this is the main mechanism for recycling dopamine that is liberated from the terminal back again, dopamine accumulates and that basically amplifies the signal. And hear me say it, amplifies the signal. Cocaine and methylphenidate are not stimulating it directly, the receptors. They're basically amplifying the, our own dopaminergic signaling by interfering with that recycling. So we had used that methodologically as an experimental strategy for PET studies where we wanted to actually document whether with this methodology we could see changes in dopamine produced by salient stimuli that were not drugs. And so in 2002, for example, we did a study to try to determine if we could see changes in raclopride when we exposed people that were food deprived to visual stimuli of very appealing food. And we observed that, uh, and that's what we call salient, that we observed that they were basically what appeared to be a decrease, but this was not significant. So in order to amplify the effect, we gave them methylphenidate. And what you observe is that methylphenidate by itself will decrease the binding, but of course, because it's increasing dopamine, you are amplifying. But when you combine methylphenidate with a salient stimuli, the visual stimuli for someone that is food deprived, you can actually observe a significant effect. And this has been used also by laboratory animal experiments and we've used it in other settings to actually use the methylphenidate to amplify dopaminergic signaling. So we then hypothesized that if in fact, we said if in sleep deprivation, you are increasing dopamine release, then if you give methylphenidate, you should be able to see an amplified response because there's more dopamine that's going to be released and this is going to be blocked. So you should be able to see a greater signal. So we designed again an experiment where subjects were brought into the laboratory on two different occasions. One of them, we kept them in the laboratory and ensured that they sleep properly. And on another day, we brought them also the night before and ensured that they did not fall asleep. The next day, we test them with the raclopride, again, but this time twice. First after a placebo to see just the placebo effect. And then 60 minutes later, we gave them methylphenidate and did another raclopride scan. And we did to ask the question, under those conditions, um, are the increases in dopamine produced by methylphenidate larger if you are sleep deprived because you are amplifying a greater signal or not? What are the results? Well, let me first go towards the behavioral effects of methylphenidate and sleep deprivation because they are actually quite interesting by itself. And again, we're seeing here uh, the measurements of sleepiness or alertness um, at different types for the rested waking state. And this is placebo and in blue is methylphenidate different times after the administration. And you can see, and again, I'll, I'll touch bases on that because this is very consistent. When you are rested and you are given methylphenidate, it does not further improve your alertness. You are already pretty alert, so you just basically have a ceiling effect. And also if your sleeping is very low, uh, methylphenidate doesn't do much. However, if you give methylphenidate to someone that is sleep deprived, you can clearly see a significant effect. It basically improves alertness and it significantly decreases sleepiness. And this is again one of the concepts that has led to the, the description of the effects of stimulant medications like methylphenidate or amphetamine of being state dependent. Its effects are going to be affected by the mental state at which you are giving them. But what about the changes in dopamine? So these are the results and I'm showing them here uh, in a different format, in the format where we, I'm identifying in the color scale here, the areas where raclopride binding was decreased by the intervention. And again, our intervention that we're comparing is placebo versus methylphenidate when you have slept very nicely all night long, and placebo versus methylphenidate when you have been sleep deprived. And uh, here is when you have been uh, rested all night long and you see the changes in all of the striatal areas. And that's where you see, and this is the magnitude of the change in the model parameter that we use to quantify the specific binding of our ligand. 
And this is where you have it in sleep deprivation. And just visually, you cannot see any difference. And when you do statistical tests to compare, is there any difference between the delta that changes in the arrested condition versus the changes produced by methylphenidate in the sleeping condition, none of the effects are significant. So we were unable to see any differences in the magnitude of the changes in dopamine uh, as a function of sleep deprivation. And when we went back and say, okay, how does that then relate to the changes in behavior that we had previously observed in the case of sleep deprivation before, again, we are documenting this completely different response and relationship to the behavioral as well as the cognitive actions, depending on whether you are evaluating uh, the changes with sleep deprivation versus when you are evaluating the changes produced by methylphenidate. When you are evaluating the changes produced by sleep deprivation, the larger the changes you produce, the lower the alertness. Uh, the larger the changes you produce, the higher the sleepiness. In contrast, when you give methylphenidate, you are also dramatically changing the raclopride binding. But in this case, the higher the decreases in the raclopride binding, the greater the alertness the higher that decreases in that you have in uh, the raclopride binding, the lower the sleepiness. It's basically two opposite patterns, which indicated to us that it is likely to be reflecting uh, different physiological processes. And that is ultimately the way that we reported it. Now, this is a studies that we are doing in humans. And as I very explicitly state, we, uh, the design of the experiment was to actually determine if there were, if we could detect differences. But we are always have the constraint of not being, at the end of the day, able to differentiate directly within the raclopride measure whether it is changes on dopamine or down regulation of the receptors. So in parallel to these studies, we conducted microdialysis experiments in rats where you can actually put a microdialysis probe into the striatum and monitor the changes in dopamine. And in these animals, we had two groups, and we follow exactly the same experimental paradigm. One group of animals with sleep deprived. And the way that you sleep deprived animals is it's extremely difficult to make animals forego sleep. So you have to put them in a tiny little platform surrounded by water so that they, when fall asleep, they lose their reflexes and they actually immediately wake up because otherwise they drown. So that is the way that you sleep deprived. The, the other way, uh, and the control was the same setup, but the platform was much larger. So if the animals lose their reflexes for, from the sleep, they can fall asleep. And then we gave them methylphenidate and we monitor the changes in dopamine. And so we have the controls in black, that are black, and we have the sleep deprived animals in gray, and these are the changes in dopamine when we gave the methylphenidate injection, and you can clearly see they are basically identical. We were unable to see any significant differences in the magnitude of the changes of dopamine produced by methylphenidate, indicating that under sleep deprivation conditions, it does not look that there is an increase in dopamine release. And that is what um, basically led us to state against that traditional mode of thinking, and again, this is not traditional mode of thinking, that sleep deprivation appears to downregulate the number of dopamine D2 receptors, the levels of receptors, dopamine D2 receptors that are in your brain. It decreases them. Now, how does it do that? And that's where we are after. It's a very intriguing, extremely interesting question. Um, is it just a normal process that through circadian variability those receptors are internalized? Or is there an active effect of sleep deprivation on bringing those receptors down? And again, it's something that we have a protocol. I don't have data uh, yet on that, that. But from the animal literature, where of course you can learn an enormous amount, studies have shown something that also has obsessed me now for many, many years. When we are awake, and the longer we are awake, because our neurons are very, very active, we want them to be active, you are actually producing adenosine as a function of activation patterns. And the longer you are awake, the higher the content of adenosine in your brain. Adenosine then acts as a neurotransmitter that binds to adenosine receptors. 
and we have three different types of adenosine receptors in the brain. The most notable are adenosine A1 and adenosine A2. Extraordinarily important for melting multiple things, and by the way, caffeine, the one that I love, basically blocks those receptors and interferes with the effects of adenosine. And adenosine in animal models makes you sleepy. And in animal models where you can genetically remove one specific receptor, adenosine 1 versus 2, it has been shown that it is the removal of the adenosine A2 receptor that is responsible for the waking effects of caffeine. And what's interesting about adenosine A2 receptors is they are located exactly in the same cells that express dopamine D2 receptors. Not only that, these two receptors form what we call our heteromer. They link with one another. And what, as they link, they influence the effects of one another. When adenosine, and this is again stoic in, in animals, when adenosine binds to this heteromer, it binds to its adenosine A2 receptor, that promotes the internalization of the receptor. And this has been reported in animals, maybe one of the mechanisms by which adenosine accumulation may result in a downregulation of dopamine D2 receptors. But this is again theoretical, and my brain likes ideas, and it's actually, but I don't, I mean, you come up with an idea, you come up with an explanation, and it just keeps on bothering me and sort of says, is there, how do you test that? How, how do you test this hypothesis of the heteromers? That, in fact, with sleep deprivation, you're actually uh, downregulating the levels of dopamine D2 receptors. And if this literature in animals is correct, then it follows the big question that we all have, why is caffeine in general overall quite effective in improving alertness? For many, many years, uh, investigators were saying, okay, caffeine increases dopamine just like other drugs of abuse. Well, the literature didn't really show that. Most studies show that different from cocaine, nicotine, alcohol, marijuana, caffeine does not increase dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. There was one paper by Sergi Ferret that said, yes, maybe, no, I don't know. But consistently, <laughs> consistently it doesn't show that. So then the question is, what does it do? And so, of course, my brain was saying, could it be that it is actually acting, caffeine acts by interfering with the downregulation of the dopamine D2 receptors with the sleep deprivation? So that's, I said, okay, let's do the study, let's try to test it. So we perform a study, again, using the C11 raclopride, but in this case, instead of actually um, being a, working, we just took people that were on rested, rested wakefulness, study them with raclopride with and without caffeine, and determine, well, what is it that caffeine is going to be doing to the availability of those dopamine D2 receptors? And what we observed, which was actually very different from anything, oh my God, this has jumped beyond my imagination, very different from anything that we have ever observed because when we give methylphenidate, we observe that it increases dopamine and that's associated with alertness. When we gave caffeine, what we observed was not that like with methylphenidate, raclopride went down. When we gave caffeine, raclopride binding went up throughout the dorsal and the ventral striatum. And you have here the individual data for all, it's quite significant. So what we are observing, it is actually very likely that caffeine is improving arousal, is not increasing dopamine because otherwise we would have observed a decrease in the binding of the ligand. But on the other hand, it seems to be interfering with that downregulation of the dopamine D2 receptors. Now with science, you know, I think that one of the interesting things that I've learned uh, with science is that I feel very strongly that this is the explanation. But at the same time, my brain, which never stops saying, well, what about? I think that there is another what about, which is the possibility that this, when you form these heteromers and you stimulate it, you may not just internalize the receptor, but you also appear to maybe uh, affecting the binding affinity of that receptor. So it, we cannot completely rule out the possibility that it's not just interfering with the downregulation of the receptors, but also it may have increased the affinity of the raclopride, uh, raclopride of the D2 receptors for raclopride. I don't think that's the explanation, but I have to basically put it forward because 
Uh, there are some that think that this may be the case. And so throughout all of these uh, studies that we have been doing with in the whole process of understanding the effects of sleep in the dopaminergic system, what we've come to realize is that sleep deprivation has a very profound effect in downregulating levels of dopamine D2 receptors. And for us in the, in, in the uh, substance abuse field, this is fundamental because one of the most consistent findings that we observe in addiction is a downregulation of those dopamine D2 receptors. And in all animal models that have been developed, whether it is cocaine, alcohol, or heroin, or even nicotine, any intervention that you do to decrease the levels of dopamine D2 receptors makes to those animals much more vulnerable for the rewarding effects of the drugs. It makes them much more vulnerable for impulsive behaviors, and it makes them much more vulnerable to compulsiveness. And again, highlighting the intricate involvement of sleep and its disruption in addiction as part of a fundamental component of the pathology of addiction. And this data, of course, is forcing us into looking backward now into our own results and trying to determine the extent to which we have in many, many independent studies in animals and in humans, and so have others, consistently documented that in addiction there is a downregulation of the dopamine D2 receptors, which we know you can produce in animals by giving them repeatedly the drug. But what we cannot rule out is that some of those effects of downregulation may be also driven by the profound disruption on sleep patterns in these individuals. And, and again, highlighting about why focus on this area of research is something that we need to do because it may also be very relevant in helping us design better therapeutic interventions. But I don't want to dwell any more on this. And I want to go into the next set of studies that we've done. Again, we haven't published this data. It is um, now in press. But it's something that has uh, started to obsess me four, four years ago. And it, is, it, it was motivated, actually, by this paper that was published in, by Niedergaard. I think it was 2014. This, this cartoon came later in which they actually, this investigator from Denmark, reported that uh, what appeared to be a new understanding about the role of sleep. And, and, and the brain, what's intriguing about the brain, among many other things that are intriguing about the brain, is that it doesn't have a lymphatic system. Every single organ in our body has a lymphatic system. And it's a very important system of blood vessels, not blood vessels, of vessels, lymphatic vessels. What am I saying, blood? They are going to get offended. It's lymphatic vessels that allow you to get rid of toxic substances that are very, very important for proper immune function. The brain doesn't have that. And this has, of course, intrigued enormously researchers because it says we have the, the, the brain is the most energetically demanding organ. So how is it getting rid of all of those waste material, toxic uh, products? So this paper for Niedergaard documented um, a mechanism by which they actually are proposing that the brain gets rid of some of these waste pro products. And they term it the glymphatic system. Glymphatic uh, from the lymphatic, but glymph, because it's uh, related to glial cells. And what they showed in rodents is that during sleep, or also produced during anesthesia, um, the, basically what happens is that the space that surrounds arteries is uh, full of cerebrospinal fluid. And during sleep, cerebrospinal fluid uh, passes from this perivascular space into the interstitial space in the brain through the glial, uh, glial um, um, which is facilitated uh, and made possible by the expression of these transporters of water that we refer to as aquaporins, and specifically, uh, aquaporin-4, which is expressed on the glial cells that uh, basically surround these blood vessels. And this allows for cerebrospinal flu to go into the interstitial space and through convection flow, remove these toxic materials that end up back into the perivascular space of veins and that ultimately drains into the lymphatic system. And they also pointed out something that was, to me, also incredibly intriguing. 
Using optical imaging, they were able to document uh, the fact that when you are asleep or in anesthesia, the interstitial space, the space outside of the cells, is increased by 40 to 60 percent. As if the cells themselves become smaller, allowing for the extracellular space to grow. And that facilitates the flow of cerebrospinal fluid and the clearance. And this completely obsessed my mind. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I said, oh my god, this is fascinating. It's fascinating. And actually, so I was, uh, and, and, I was uh, and it was an interesting phenomenon because I said, how do we demonstrate this in humans? Because no one has shown this in humans. Do we, do we, was there any data to indicate that something was out there? We knew from studies that have been done, actually, in animals and in humans, that the clearance of some of these waste products, and in particular, a lot of work has been done on beta amyloid, because beta amyloid is the precursor that actually results in plaques, the amyloid plaques that are basically responsible, believed to be responsible for Alzheimer's dementia. And it has been shown, as for some of these studies that I'm, I'm looking at this, that indeed, when you, for example, sleep deprived animals, and this is a, a, a fantastic study that was published in 2009 in Science, and in this study that was done in mice, they actually demonstrate not only that acute, but also chronic sleep, uh, uh, sleep disturbances, disruption in these mice, significantly increases the content of beta amyloid. In this case, they were looking at the hippocampus. And it was a, a, a very much, if you get uh, animals to sleep, you basically can clear that beta amyloid that occurs with a single night of sleep deprivation. So this is the data with, um, chronic sleep deprivation. Human studies, human studies have looked at the cerebrospinal fluid, and then you can con actually measure the content of beta amyloid. And in these studies, they have also shown that if you take a person, this is a study in 2014, at the same time that the paper for Niederar came up in science, that if you take a person and you sleep deprive them, you can actually, or even not, let's not even sleep deprived. If I measure your cerebrospinal fluid, I can do a lumbar puncture here, extract cerebrospinal fluid, and I measure your beta amyloid content, say at 6 p.m., 7 p.m., and then I measure it in the morning, say at 9, 10 a.m., the content of the cerebrospinal fluid is going to be 6% lower in the morning than in the evening. Again, consistent with the concept that during sleep, you are clearing the beta amyloid, and that leads to then a lower reduction in the content of CSF. And also, a series of imaging studies have been done retrospectively using PET ligands that are used predominantly for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease on the basis that these PET ligands bind to beta amyloid, so you can use them to actually quantify amyloid burden in the brain. And of course, in Alzheimer's disease, you see a significant increase. But if you take normal, healthy people of different ages, studies by the predominantly done in an elderly population of healthy individuals has shown that those individuals that have inadequate sleep uh, patterns tended to have higher content of beta amyloid. And, and I get there, there's now, I think, four of these studies that have been able to replicate it retrospectively to indicate to us that in animals, yes, one night of sleep deprivation did raise beta amyloid in, in the brain of these mice, in the hippocampus, it was something like 16 or, or 20%. It was a fairly large effect. And in the cerebrospinal fluid, the effect of sleep of decreasing it by 6%. And this thought then occurred to me, and I was drinking a glass of wine. I had to go, I wasn't drinking coffee, I was drinking a glass of wine. And I was in one of my exuberant moods, and I said, aha, now I know how to test it. I said, in my brain, he said, of course, if, we, if, the, if the glymphatic system operates in the human brain, then it would follow that if I take advantage of these PET ligands that are being used to measure beta amyloid in brain, I should be able to document that if I sleep deprive someone, just like the animal experiments have shown, I should be able to see an increase of beta amyloid in the human brain. And I was very excited and said, oh, I have a great idea, blah, blah, blah. And I started then, of course, you do the literature search, you speak with the experts that have developed this radioliga, and I said, Nora, is not going to work. 
because the beta amyloid PET ligands are binding to insoluble fiber, insoluble one, that's plaque. And so I gave, I gave the idea, I was very depressed, and so it says 10 months, 12 months. And then I started to go back to the literature and actually look at the studies that have looked at people prospectively. And something started to bother me. It started to bother me because there was not perfect reproducibility. And it's not that if you were studied six months apart or one year apart, you always saw an increase in the binding of these ligands. In some instances, they were going down. And I said, could it be that they are not as insoluble as everybody's saying? And sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and say, I'm going to take the risk. So I said, OK, I'm going to take the risk. We put the protocol. And uh, through the IRB, it got approved. And we finally finished the study. And I'm going to show you the results. So our hypothesis were two. One of them is we use a PET ligand, fluorbetaven, which is one that you can actually, if you don't have a cyclotron and a fancy laboratory, you can actually order it because it's cl used clinically for diagnosing patients with Alzheimer's disease. And so we said we're going to do a study in which we're going to measure floor beta band binding in the human brain under two conditions, rested sleep versus 24 hours of sleep deprivation, all night sleep deprivation, and see if we are increasing the binding. And because the animal studies had seen the largest effects, we a priori predicted that on the basis of what we know from humans, animal studies, the increases should be greater in the hippocampus. And also the hippocampus is the area of the brain that's more sen one of the most sensitive areas of pathology to Alzheimer's disease. But we also wanted to see if in our sample, which was of younger individuals, we could replicate the prior findings that if you have impaired sleep, uh, chronic impaired patterns of sleep, that will be associated on their baseline, no sleep deprivation, your just baseline condition, higher levels of beta amyloid. And so we recruited 20 healthy participants each of them tested twice after more or less 31 hours of sleep deprivation versus, again, we bring them to the clinical center, ensure that they sleep properly. We have polysomnography to, to be sure that they are asleep. We wake them up in the morning at the same time of the day, and we do the PET floor beta band scan. We also measure their genes for genotyping them for the APOE genotype because there have been, I mean, there's clear data in, in healthy controls and in Alzheimer's patients that the genotype risk that confers greater vulnerability for Alzheimer's also is associated with a greater vulnerability for accumulation of beta amyloid in the human brain, particularly in older individuals. And of course, we monitor, we, we record their, their patterns of sleep and the, the effects of sleep deprivation on their alertness and mood. So what did we observe? And these are the data. It actually speaks for itself. And uh, Dr. Esan Shokri, who's uh, a fellow in my laboratory, was the one that actually did this very elegant analysis and reserves all of the credit for having developed so, such a sophisticated pattern uh, of analysis. And what he showed, uh, applying a, a voxel-wide analysis to the whole brain to try to determine where there were changes between rested versus sleep deprivation on the accumulation of this ligand that binds to beta amyloid, where showed basically there were significant increases in this cluster of area of subcortical regions that actually uh, part of it is encompassed within the hippocampus, not just in the hippocampus. We also see accumulation in the thalamus and parahippocampal areas. And, and then they said, well, basically I asked Essen, and I said, well, Essen, we're seeing it is significant, and this is significant at the corrector for multiple comparisons, but is it significant, is it driven by a couple of subjects, or how consistent is this finding? So then he extracted regions in the hippocampus, and for each one of them, uh, monitor the values of the beta amyloid PET ligand at rested versus sleep deprivation, and you can basically see consistently for almost all subjects there was an increase in the binding of the beta amyloid. And this is one night of sleep deprivation. And of course, there, were, there was a couple of, of people where you didn't see it, but more basically consistently, very, that's why it's so significant. And interestingly, what the, in the hippocampus, that changes the accumulation of the beta amyloid with the sleep deprivation, per se in the hippocampus was not associated with sleepiness or decreased alertness or tiredness. It was associated with a decrease in mood. The greater the accumulation of this beta amyloid in the hippocampus, the more irritable and uh, dysphoric the subjects felt. 
Uh, uh, something that I did not and we did not a priori expect, and I, I think it is, I, I'm putting it forward because I, uh, we did observe, was that it was only significant in the right but not in the left hippocampus. I can give you an explanation about why that could be possible, but we didn't a priori uh, propose that. That was an unexpected finding. Now, what about the effects on not on sleep deprivation, but the scans where you are actually at baseline for the accumulation of beta amyloid in the brain versus the hours of sleep uh, reported by the subjects? And what we observe here as well as what are the effects of the uh, genetic risk based on the APO, a, APOE polymorphism. There are two polymorphisms that have been widely investigated and associated with greater risk. So you can put a weight on those two polymorphisms and based on that determine how do they influence the accumulation of beta amyloid. And this actually summarizes the finding. So these are the areas in red where there is an association between higher levels of beta amyloid binding ligand and less hours of sleep reported by the subjects. So subjects that had lower amounts of sleep had higher accumulation of beta amyloid in this area of the brain that is called the precuneus that is very important, extraordinarily important for alertness. But also it's one of the areas that is um, probably, actually if not, the area that shows the first evidence of dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease. It's an area that's constantly active all the time. It's basically one of the main hubs of the brain, and that's where you see a higher accumulation. You also see higher accumulation in areas of the hippocampus, and it's not exactly in the same regions. There's some overlap with the areas that we observe in acute sleep deprivation, but there is no, you cannot say it's the same they are distinct areas. This pattern is much more widespread than what we observe with, with acute sleep deprivation. And it's also clearly distinct for the pattern that we observe an association between the gene risk allele and the accumulation of beta amyloid, which tends to involve much more prefrontal cortical areas. And this just shows that the shorter the amount of sleep hours that you report, the greater the accumulation. So what is it that we conclude from this? That we conclude for the first time, we show, and I think that it's something that cannot be ignored. One single night of sleep deprivation produces a significant increase on beta amyloid in the human brain. Now, certainly what I would predict, and this would be the follow-up uh, experiment, is I predict that if you allow these individuals to fall asleep, you will be able to clear the beta amyloid. In other words, it's not a re irreversible, harmful effect. The question emerges is, if you chronically are sleep deprived, is there a point that that constant accumulation of the beta amyloid starts to harm your brain? And I think that is the issue that is most relevant as it relates to prevention messages uh, towards prevention of Alzheimer's disease and dementia the importance of healthy sleep habits in order to preclude the accumulation of beta amyloid. And I'm standing here four years later uh, when I basically was in one of my flamboyant moods trying to figure out if we could figure out a way of imaging the lymphatic system. I cannot say that this reflects the lymphatic system. We postulate that the accumulation is due to the fact that the lymphatic system may have not worked because they were sleep deprived. But from animal experiments, we cannot neither rule the possibility that there are other mechanisms by which beta amyloid is clear, number one. And the other very important factor is that when you are sleep deprived, you also have greater production of neuronal toxic material. So that may have led to a greater accumulation. And we cannot differentiate that. So we are still going on trying to figure out a measure, an imaging methodology that will allow us and enable us to unequivocally say, yes, this is evidence that there is lymphatic function in the human brain. But what I can tell you from these studies is this is clear evidence that sleep plays an extraordinarily important role, not just on regulating dopaminergic signaling and that driving motivation and reward and reinforcement, 
but also very, very importantly in terms of it's the capacity of the brain to clear uh, and renew itself after um, a period of um, continued arousal and highlighting again why in many perspectives sleep has been a major neglected subject of research but also a major neglected aspect of uh, clinical interventions or behavioral interventions that could result in very profound salutary effects. And with that, I do want to thank, uh, this is my, my group at NIH and our imaging group who actually were very, very creative and does all of the work. I was actually, uh, this is Esan uh, Shokri that did all of the analysis. Uh, we have been colleagues since Brookhaven National Laboratory, he's fantastic. Uh, he can get things done that nobody else in the world can. I mean, he has the capacity of managing extraordinary difficult teams. He's a nuclear medicine physician. Dardo Tomasi is the physicist of our group, and a lot of this is related to instrumentation. Uh, Sonny Kim is our, our radiochemist, also can label things that nobody can. And uh, Barry Sukri, who's actually from, from, uh, from he's uh, um, Turkish, and he also is a physicist. Uh, Esan is a bioengineering. Corinda Wires, which is phenomenal, is just a dynamo, and she's a neuropsychologist. And um, this is our extraordinary nurse that comes in the middle of the night to ensure that people are staying away. <laughs> and this is Peter Mansa, it's our uh, newest uh, postdoc, and just keep an eye on them because they are really extraordinary stars, and you will be hearing more and more on them. Um, so I'm very, very lucky to have such a fantastic team. And I want to thank you all for your attention. Hi, what a wonderful talk. Um, my name is Bob Stickold. I'm director of the Center for Sleep and Cognition at Harvard Med. And I just am so delighted that you're working to increase awareness and, our, and knowledge about sleep and sleep deprivation, try to get us past that point of view that sleep is just to cure sleepiness. Um, but I had a couple of questions, which I wrote down so I'd remember. Um, so D2, our D2 receptors go down with sleep deprivation. And then you take caffeine, and that stops it, right? But you take a you do this, I don't drink coffee, but you get a cup of coffee, and a half hour you feel better. And in a half hour, you're not having any effect on that internalization rate, right? Well, to me, the effects of sleep, uh, uh, of caffeine, last like eight or 10 hours. So as a result of that, I, as much as I love coffee, I cannot drink anything after 10 a.m. Right, but and uh, in fact, in sometimes if I, sleep, uh, if I drink a lot of coffee, uh, it interferes with my sleep during the night. I wake up very, very early. So I don't know that it is so, I mean, certainly such a short effect. I think that nobody has studied it and it's likely that there's tremendous variability because there are people to whom caffeine doesn't do anything. So, and the duration of those effects also vary. And as you know, the other aspect that is very relevant is you become tolerant to the effects of caffeine very rapidly. And so the question when you are discussing it, you become tolerant to it, what does it really mean? Do you actually interfere with the formation of those heteromers uh, so that you no longer can interfere with the, the internalization? It hasn't been studied. So, so in, in, I, and I, because we just did a one time point and I cannot tell you how long it, it would be, a, it would be actually very intriguing to look at how long it takes to get back to, but no one has looked at that. There is a group in Europe that actually also show exactly the same thing uh, than us on caffeine bringing up those receptors, but like us, they didn't follow it up to see uh, how long that lasted. Okay, thank you. And then the second question I just have to ask you is 40 hertz stimulation and glial effects in relationship to Alzheimer, do you know this story? Yes, sorry, I didn't catch the, the question. Sorry, there's data now that if you do 40 hertz transcranial yes. electric, um, that you can affect levels of A beta. I mean, there, there is an enormous amount of interest, of course, to try to uh, use different strategies to 
to, on the one hand, get, uh, get rid of beta amyloid, and on the other one, to stimulate neuronal systems so that, because that's another proactive, protective effect towards, towards uh, dementia. Another one is to improve uh, uh, blood vessel and circulation to also help it. So all, all of these are interesting um, strategies. As of now, the evidence has not been strong enough to say this is something that we should move forward that will get an indication. What I would move forward, though, based on this data and the data from others, is that probably one of the most important prevention interventions that you can do against Alzheimer's is to try to ensure that you sleep properly. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Scott Beckett. I'm a registered polysomnographic technician at the uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, Division of Sleep Medicine. And I also have done a lot of uh, volunteer work with alcoholics and addicts over the past five years. And um, I think that your studies on the reward system of uh, drugs of abuse is interesting, but um, it just brought up the first question, which is, uh, why is it then that like, when people are removed from drugs for an extremely long period of time, decades even, they'll still want to go back to those drugs and be addicted to them just as badly as they were decades before? Yeah, no, and that, that element, which is basically called conditioning, has been uh, widely investigated very elegantly in animals, also in humans, but in animals you can actually be able to dissect which are the proteins that are responsible for this long-lasting effect. And this entails when you stimulate uh, with uh, drugs or any stimulation that is very powerful, you actually create an activation of, of the D1 receptor system that creates a memory. And the way that that memory is created, it basically strengthens the connectivity between synapses. And uh, the synapses that have been most studied where this is strengthened is glutamatergic excitatory synapses. And that strengthening involves, on the one hand, um, expression of different type of receptors and down degradation of others. So you change the composition of those receptors. And the complexity of those synaptics, synapses also morphologically changes. And that is quite long lasting. So those, those phenomena persist way after you stop taking the drug. And by themselves, when you get exposed to an environment where you, in the past, or an emotion that in the past had led you to associate with drugs, immediately create a memory. So you stimulate the system, and that, that foregoes the frontal cortex. It's like when you touch something that is hot that you immediately remove it. It's an automatic response. That's, I mean, that's one of the most challenging aspects that we see in addiction, that you have these, these um, modified learning pathways that can trigger that behavior uh, under conditions uh, that emulate uh, the prior experiences. And, and because a lot of people that are taking drugs cannot control necessarily when they are going to be exposed to a very stressful environment, that puts them at a tremendous amount of risk of relapse, or, or they cannot really escape their environments. So that, that's, that, is, that initially is mediated by dopamine, but it is consolidated by glutamatergic system as well as other neurotransmitters. Well, uh, that actually leads me to my second question. You're talking about how they can't control their exposure to stressful environments. And um, I found your second topic on the beta amyloid and the lymphatic system uh, I thought you were going to tie them together because in my experience with alcoholics and addicts, there's a lot of caffeine abuse, nicotine abuse, long-term uh, poor sleep hygiene and uh, kind of destructive behaviors even without drugs. They persist long into the, their life even after they've been uh, sober for years. And um, could that long-term poor sleep hygiene and all these other things I just described lead to some sort of like buildup of beta amyloid chronically, which uh, causes a chronic decrement in mood and then leads to relapse? Yeah, no, and, 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 and that, that same question has started to emerge in my brain. I mean, and, I, and if you look at the literature, though, there's very little there. There is an association of higher risk of dementia with alcohol. But if you look at it carefully, the problem with all of these toys on drugs is 
These drugs also profoundly damage blood vessels, and it depends on which one. And certainly, for example, in the case of stimulant drugs like methamphetamine or cocaine or even uh, cannabis, and they, they also have inflammatory processes. So you could be producing cognitive damage and dementia through these vascular phenomena. You could also, by disrupting sleep, put them at greater risk of accumulation. But it hasn't really been studied at all, and I do think it's an important question. And I don't, because I don't have any data, I, I don't feel in any way to say, I mean, this could be a risk factor. I think that we need to concede that it could be because it is having multiple effects that are harmful to the brain, including sleep disruption, but also markedly damaging uh, perfusion into the brain, which is another factor that increases your risk for dementia. I just want to clarify. Um... I wasn't talking about uh, the buildup of beta amyloid from long-term drug use. I was talking about when they were off of the drugs in question for a long period of time. They continued with like unhealthy sleep behaviors, and that led to the buildup. Yeah, no, of no, I, I, I follow. Yeah, no, I do. But the, the, the bottom line is we don't have any studies that have looked at it. Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering whether or not sleep deprivation with psychostimulants such as cocaine, amphetamines, would give rise to, theoretically, a higher level of accumulation of beta amyloid compared to other addictive drugs such as benzodiazepines or uh, even heroin, which are more sedating as well as um, partially euphoriant. Or alcohol, which can also be sedating. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think it's an interesting question, and you know, and, and again, one of the, the concepts that I was in my flamboyant mood, I was sort of basically, and this happened at an ACMP meeting, and that's why I was drinking a glass of wine. I remember very clearly. It's interesting how you remember certain moments when I thought about this experiment, and uh, then I said, well, haha, -ha, what we should do for uh, helping treat um, patients with Alzheimer's dementia is we put them on a coma, we put them to sleep for five days, right? <laughs> Let them clear their brain. And I'm, I was saying it, of course, on their alcohol intoxication. I, <laughs> because one class will do it for me. But I think that this is actually, uh, I, I do think it is a valid concept. And could we, if we understand it better, could we then actually design interventions? And you, again, you have to be cautious because, of course, you say, if you put someone on anesthesia to try to, because this, in the animals, the lymphatic system works with anesthesia. But we also know that an anesthetics themselves may have cognitively impairing effects. So we need to understand what are the drugs, and there are multiple processes in darkness that we don't really know very well before we come up with an intervention. Hi. Um, I was noticing that when you talked about sleep deprivation and being able to clear the brain, you were basing it on number of hours of sleep. And I was wondering what work had been done looking at sleep apnea and its effect. Yeah, no, and, I, and, and the, it is, um, I, think, I think that, that there would be data. Sleep apnea is one of the factors that, that puts you, it's considered, I think it's one of the factors that is considered as put you at higher risk of dementia. But I mean, this is the, the first, I mean, and I, the studies that have reported on on chronic sleep restriction, the first one was the group in, in Baltimore, the intramural program at the Aging Institute, which was something like three years ago, have been done on prospective studies that are following these individuals. But no one that I know, not on a paper, that certainly that has specifically studied um, the severity of the sleep apnea under those conditions with respect to the beta amyloid. But I'm going to, I'm going to check and do a PubMed because there may be and I just don't know. Good morning, somewhere. Um, I have two questions. My first is a yes, no question. Um, is there any data that meditation may be, uh, provide a close approximation to sleep when it comes to the detoxification of, uh, of the brain. Uh, I know the lymphatic you know, model is relatively new, but uh, uh, th that's just quite for my first question. No data. Okay. Uh, you said yes, no, no data. Uh, two number words. two, the, uh, so I guess there's been uh, 30 or 40 years in Europe 
with the clinical use of racetams to address age-associated memory impairment uh, and neurodegeneration. I'm wondering if, I'm wondering what your take is on that, although it is certainly not an FDA-approved approach. Yeah, I, I, mean, the, I mean, this is one of the mechanisms, and, and we do know that the cholinergic system is also extraordinarily important in sustaining sleep and arousal. And one of the diagrams that I have there, you have the monoaminergic system, and then you have the cholinergic systems. And they do regulate, and they basically modulate uh, alertness, but they also modulate memory. So the, the extent to which we can try to explain a, a, everything on the, one, on the one particular model, I think it's very simplistic. And I would be uh, surprised if there are not other interventions. And, and, and again, I haven't spoken either about the noradrenergic system, which is also very important for giving you a sense of overall alertness. So we, we identified in this very specific case the role of sleep deprivation and sleep as it relates to the clearance of beta amyloid. The, we know that noradrenergic system is crucial for enabling sleep. So if you stimulate the locus ceruleus, those animals are not going to sleep. And in fact, one of the anesthetic agents that they use, dextotimidine, is basically interferes, it's one of its mechanisms of action is it blocks noradrenergic signaling. And it actually promotes very nicely the lymphatic system. And you can interfere with some of these effects by blocking the adrenergic receptors. So, so I, I, and I'm just bringing it up because the cholinergic system, the nicotinergic system, which is highly loaded in the thalamus, is another very important alerting system. So I don't want in any way to just say this explains all this explains clearly. It documents that sleep deprivation can lead to beta amyloid uh, accumulation, which basically in my brain suggests that one of the roles of sleep is clearance. It also shows from our first toys that another role of sleep is to basically modulate um, noradrenergic, in this case, dopaminergic neurotransmission throughout the day to ensure that there's uh, optimal range of activity. So those are two things that we've demonstrated, but I, I would be surprised that there's not many more things for, to discover in the sleep space. Thank you. So please join me in thanking Dr. Valka for a wonderful lecture.